Uh, I want to welcome you all. My name is Lynn Penny, and I know many, but not all of you. I'm thrilled that we have this large turnout. <coughs> it's a great pleasure to have Martin Karna here, and I think if you look around the room, you'll recognize in part uh, how unusual it is to have a faculty member who can draw a range of people with a range of backgrounds and interests. And um, I'm, uh, as I said, delighted that we have this chance to welcome you today. Um, Amita is going to introduce him, but I can't help but share one story. My first day as a graduate student at Stanford, my first professor, as I walked in, very nervous, first year PhD student, we were all sitting there in a room, in a room with chairs facing forward. And in walks this guy with his yogurt. He's in a t-shirt. He sits down, he starts eating and visiting and teaching. He's just finished playing soccer, I think. And I thought, wait a minute, what, what, where, where am I? And there was something about Martin that looked so casual and so easy and so effortless. And then within weeks, it was very obvious that this is a mind that is agile playing soccer, eating over, talking about complicated ideas with people from around the world. Um, and so it's really a joy on a very cold day to welcome back my first professor. And so now Amita, a more recent student, has the pleasure of giving a real pleasure. Oh, no, yes, yes. Uh, hi, welcome everyone. What an amazing turnout. It's so great to see so many. I actually wrote a couple of things down which I'm going to keep here as well. Um, but as Lynn just said, I mean, it truly is for me too such an honor and a pleasure to welcome Professor Martin Carnoy. Um, Martin has, you know, as a teacher and a mentor, has, has meant so much to me. And as I was reflecting on this brief introduction, <coughs> his teaching and mentorship truly bookended my time at Stanford as well. So just like Lynn Payne, Martin's class in Economics of Education was the very first class I took at Stanford University arriving fresh from India, and you can imagine how amazing that must have been to walk into this you know, brand new experience in a brand new country, in a brand new place, and get to work with him. And it was also, Martin may or may not remember this, but it was his mentorship as I was finishing my PhD, that Martin, through his foresight and connections, helped me get connected to Michigan State University. And then it's a longer story, but it is through that connection that eventually I ended up coming here, and here I am a decade later, as you say, the rest is history. So I truly personally owe so much to Martin's teaching and mentorship to sort of what, how things have shaped up for me in my own career. But I mean, as you can imagine, and as Lynn was just saying, Martin is not just an amazing teacher and a mentor, but he's also a prolific scholar and a thinker. And so I'll be honest, you know, when Lynn asked me if I could introduce him, I said, oh my gosh, how can I? You know, like, how can I in a few minutes <coughs> say everything I want to say about someone who is uh, such a prominent scholar and someone I think so highly of myself? But anyway, here I am doing just that, trying to introduce him in a couple of minutes. And so I'm going to read a couple of notes that I have. Um, Martin, as some of you might know, Professor Martin Carnoy is the Obida Czechs Professor of Education at Stanford University School of Education. Professor Carnot is a labor economist with a special interest in the political economy of the education system. He specializes in comparative analysis. And I see many of my students, I know many of you have read his work as well, so it's great to have you in the room too. Martin has several distinctions to his credit, too numerous to mention. But just to sort of note a couple of them, he is the member of National Academy of Education and the International <coughs> Academy of Education and has been a president of the Comparative and International Education Society as well. Dr. Carno is not just a prolific scholar, thinker, teacher, and mentor, but he also has extensive experience as a consultant to the World Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, Asian Development Bank, UNESCO, IEA, OECD, UNICEF, and the ILO. He is one of the most prolific scholars and foremost thinkers in the field of international and comparative education and in education policy more broadly. It is such a pleasure and honor, Martin, to welcome you. Please join me in giving him a warm hand. Well, uh, I have to say it's a very emotional visit for me to come here. Um, I, the Michigan State, strangely enough, it is probably the university I have the most connection to outside of Stanford. 
uh, so many friends that I have here and so many people I've worked with. And um, um, I have uh, David Plank, who used to be a professor here, is now my colleague at Stanford, and we run together with Eric Bettinger uh, at the um, London Center uh, on Brazilian Education, which is, which is in the School of Education, which is um, which occupies a, a high fraction of my time now. So uh, there's that connection, but my connection with um, Bill Schmidt, who's a dear, dear friend, um, I got to see here. And um, so in any case, uh, I have just very close to High State University. It's a great, it's a great <coughs> Erickson Hall is like, uh, I would say, the second most visited place in my academic travels. Uh, wow. <laughs> it's quite a direct route. To well, it isn't a direct route, but it's a, it's um, <laughs> it's well worth the detour. Anyway, um, I'm going to talk to you ab about one uh, chapter in a book that I published this last year, uh, which I hope you'll all read. Un unlike most books written by academics, it's cheap. <laughs> uh, it's uh, you can get this book for twenty bucks on uh, Amazon, and or from Stanford Press, same price. And it's it's a story about Stanford. And I, Jack Schwilly is not here today because he's traveling. But uh, we at uh, the Comparative Ed Society meetings had a debate. I don't know if you call it that, but about because Jack is a um, foremost proponent of the way the Michigan State organizes its international studies. And uh, it's, uh, as I've often told people, if, if Michigan State had, would ever form a doctoral program and a master's program, which I understand is in the works, in comparative international <coughs> education, it would have the largest faculty of any university in the world in this field. Uh, Stanford only has you know, three and a third people working on this, uh, and for, and three we had only three people all these years who have produced all these students that we produced. We, I personally have chaired a hundred doctoral <coughs> dissertations, and these are not part of that hundred, but <laughs> these two guys. But um, I think we have in the last fifty years. I would say close to almost 300 PhDs in comparative international education. Many of them, some of them ended up teaching here. And Michigan State has a lot of PhDs who are international with them. So anyway, this book is, we not only did that, but we also had a center of activity where we did a lot of theory. And the theory didn't all come from uh, us, it came from the sociology department, but in any case, I review all these theories here in chronological order, and so it's a good for people who are interested not only just in, in international stuff, but it's actually pretty much the underlying theories, uh, not including psychological theories, the underlying social theories uh, for education. The competing theories, by the way, they don't agree with each other. And so it's worth really understanding this. Uh, anyway, I want to talk to you about one chapter in this book about international tests. And so the, I want to just tell you in the comparative work, uh, international testing today is the dominant uh, form of comparative education, for better or for worse. Um, it was started in the 1960s in an effort to get more data to do comparative work. Uh, among countries, because most of the stuff was anecdotal until then. People would go to countries, they would report that something was happening, the whole idea of borrowing was very important, it still is. And in any case, there was a movement in the 1950s um, to try to get more data, and by the middle of the 60s, they started, um, they got money from the Department of Education in the U.S., and they uh, did the first international comparative test, uh, which was called the first international math survey, GEMS, and it was never expected that this stuff was supposed to really 
you know, do would be a lead table of whose education system was better or not. It was supposed to be organized to get more information about what was happening in different countries and what, how you could use these data, perhaps, to find out whether there were generalities that you could draw about uh, certain stuff about the way education uh, operated in different countries and whether you could draw some generalities. And they did come up with some generalities. Interestingly enough, number one was that social class was very important in determining how well kids scored on these tests. Okay, well, that's an interesting finding. Uh, uh, Coleman had done it in the United States just a couple of years before. Now they said, well, it's across countries. They had other stuff coming out of that too, about, about tracking and things like that. But because of the international competition, increased international competition with this globalization, all of a sudden, this test which had existed and morphed into the third international uh, math survey in 1995, where the, uh, Bill uh, Schmidt's group here at MSU was a lead, leading, played a leading role in this test, by the way, Richard Wong. Good. You were you already around at that time? So they produced a great <laughs> you, look, you look younger, you know. I'll pay you a compliment. So. Uh, anyway, so they, they did this amazing report that, on math education, uh, which, which became very influential about American, that the American system compared with other systems with uh, teaching, of uh, doing math, was a, a mile wide and an inch deep. Very famous way to calculate, very clever way to calculate. Anyway, so then, <coughs> until that time, this was the, really the only international and all of a sudden, the PISA came along. There are other tests involved at the end of the 90s. UNESCO did a test in, the, um, in Latin America. Another, uh, uh, UNESCO did another test in, in Eastern Southern Africa, uh, also in the late 90s, early 2000s. And so we have those tests. And so this has become now a, a huge force in comparative education. So I want to just draw one distinction here. International testing is not the same as educational assessment. Educational assessment, there are many forms of educational assessment. And educational assessment uh, uh, can be benchmarking, can be longitudinal surveys. Uh, but in any case, most assessment is used for accountability of some sense, of to try to understand it's used to uh, actually, hopefully, make decisions about policy in education, which has to do with one local state or entity. So it's for administrative decisions. So I want to draw that distinction. I'm going to say a lot of bad things about particularly the PISA, but that doesn't mean that I'm against assessment. I happen to have written one of the articles, uh, first articles arguing, that I mean, many people don't like this, the results of this article, but it turns out they were later affirmed by other stuff, that showed that the accountability systems that were put in first under Clinton and even No Child Left Behind had some positive effects on test scores. I'm not saying I'm learning, but on test scores, uh, and uh, helped make some improvements, particularly for low-income uh, kids. Uh, so, the assessment, that's a different kind of, you've got to separate out these two things. <coughs> so, let's skip that. So, here's the, the good news. The good news about international testing is it provides massive amounts of data, which was the original intention of international testing, to provide a lot of data. And so, um, we, we just know a lot more about education in various countries because of these tests. Not just because of the tests, but because of the, all the other data that are, that are collected as part of these tests on students, on teachers, on schools, etc. And a lot of these countries do not have such good, very good data in general. And so, for many countries, <coughs> these tests provide 
at least uh, information to the researchers about uh, these systems. The data are not particularly used in that way, and that's one of my critiques. They're not used to find out more about how these systems operate, uh, but um, they certainly could be used as part of description of educational systems. And uh, I like to use the data in that way. I, I like to look at the data. If I, if I really want to know something just off the bat about a country, I have accessible to me all the visa data, all the TIMS data, uh, it's publicly available. You can quickly do a lot of calculations using those data, and you can find out a lot about the distribution of test scores in the country, what social class, how they, in some cases, how they progressed over long periods of time, and what's happening in some countries, federal countries. There's some countries that take data by state, a few, um, uh, and so you can actually look at the country up within countries, etc. So that's, in the Tim's data, you get tons of data about teachers, um, and in many cases, changes over time. So all of this provides you with a lot of information. So that's the good news. The bad news is that international test results are being used, particularly by OECD, to push educational policies based on simple correlation between treat, so-called treatment and student outcomes. And not only that, uh, they push policies not based on any direct empirical evidence whatsoever, or very bad evidence, let's put it that way. Uh, and some of my economist colleagues are to blame for this bad evidence because they know better than it, but it's a way to get fame and notoriety, uh, and they use it. Um, it. It's not, I don't know if you know this, but academics are not the purest that they like to think of themselves as. Um, and they're just as susceptible to uh, uh, greed and corruption as anybody else. Uh, and so being famous as an academic, since you don't earn very much money, it's a good, it for some people, is a real, you know, great thing. So these data can provide lots of information, and if you're clever at using them, you can uh, do stuff. Um, I blame them less than the OECD, which is an international organization and should know also better. And, um, but they push policies that may or may not be effective, and I'm going to show you examples of some stuff. But they also, um, the worst thing they do is they uh, potentially, it's a potentially perverse incentive to exemplify high scoring countries and that it promotes implicitly prioritizing test results as the end-all, the be-all and end-all of education. And, and it also motivates teaching to the test, by the way. Um, and there, I, I, I've interviewed in countries that have um, made, done pretty well on the PISA, and they've done so by <clears throat> basically uh, uh, getting schools to teach to the PISA and therefore get their scores up. Okay, well, pretty simple. It, it is the best way to get your test scores up, is to teach you the test. I mean, it's not bad if it's a good test, okay, but there, um, if, if this is the message that the OECD wants to, to uh, put out, I don't think it's a great message uh, to people. But in any, it, it, by the way, they do believe that OECD believes that this test is so good that if everybody just changed their educational systems to work, to do well on this test, uh, every, everybody would be in seventh heaven. So uh, they, they do believe this. I mean, Schleicher, who runs it, does believe this. I've talked to him about it. Uh, anyway, it also implicitly suggests that educational practices and structures can be easily moved from one country to the next, which has been shown in very good research. Um, particularly in England, that this, uh, this is not correct. The borrowing, borrowing is not so simple as it seems. You can borrow some things, but you can't borrow a lot of them. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a great proponent of trying to figure out uh, what people are doing right, what countries are doing right uh, or doing well, and uh, adopting what you can 
But the idea that you should become like those countries is not so easy. So here's the OECD philosophy. I'm focusing on that because the IEA does not have this philosophy, by the way. Uh, the IEA operates uh, pretty much on the NCS, the NCS National Center of Education Statistics in the U.S. It operates on NCS rules. NCS rules are, they put out the data, but they don't analyze the data. That's the rule. The federal government cannot analyze the data that it collects. Mm -hmm. It has to just put out the data and allow researchers, independent researchers, to analyze the data. That's the law, by the way. It's not an implicit rule, it's the law. And, and IEA follows the law, the, the Tim's people follow that law. They just put out one volume, which is the test results, organized in certain ways, and that's, that, yeah, we can argue whether they organize the data as they should, but they don't, they don't provide any analysis. OECD provides its own analysis. Before you ever see publicly available test score, you've got four volumes ready to go that you have. They're ready to read with all the analysis done by the OECD. And so countries that don't have the wherewithal to read and analyze these data, they only use what the OECD provides. So the underlying theme is that the um, that these test scores uh, basically are measures of the quality of the country's educational system. And I knew this was going to happen. I just <laughs> I meant to turn my phone. Excuse me. I was so taken by your introduction. I, <laughs> I was so mesmerized when you were talking. <laughs> anyway. Um, so the other implicit thing is that all nations uh, n can learn how to produce high achievement scores okay? uh, by emulating the features of the educational systems of the countries that score high, the high scoring countries. And of course, social we, everybody knows that social class affects student test scores, right? So you think that right off the bat, all the test scores we presented corrected for social class differences. you think that, right? I mean, this was one of the IEA's main findings with the PIMS. Everybody knows this. The OECD knows this, everybody. The test scores are not presented correcting for social class. Okay? Neither over time, because the samples change over time, neither across countries, where there are huge differences. In social okay. So, implicitly, the OECD will face things like this. Vietnam is a poor country in scoring high. They score almost as high as the U.S. Therefore, the U.S. has a terrible education system. By the way, Vietnam is a communist country, and one of the implicit things that I would gain is that in order for the U.S. to have the same educational system as Vietnam, they should become communist. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bernie, forever. <laughs> so that, um, I mean, I don't think that's the lesson that the OEC wants you to take away from it. What they're saying is that somehow the U.S. educational system should become more like the Vietnamese system. Uh, and. Um, so they pull the social class card when it's convenient, but they don't pull the, they don't really present the data in that way, and that's the way they should present the data right off the bat. I was on the, the scientific board of the UNESCO test uh, testing, which is the third round of the uh, UNESCO test, 97, 2007, 2014. So I was on the 2014 board, and I I didn't. I did all these board meetings at distance because I didn't think it was easy during teaching term to apply to Santiago and places like that. So I would tell them over and over again, and I knew the people personally who were doing this, and I begged them that on the second page of the report, they should have the social class adjusted data. Because there are huge differences between Central America and Chile in terms of, even when you correct Mexico to Chile, the differences decline. Okay. So 
The argument is very interesting. The argument is, they argued back, very interesting argument, and I talk about it in the book, and that is, well, social class is one of the things that you have to overcome in order to have better performance in school. I, I agree with that. But, I, but you don't, I say you don't discuss this. This means that you have to do a lot of stuff outside of school in order to get those test scores up. But you're, when someone reads that report, and when someone reads the OECD report, and the OECD tells you this, it's the education system. It's not people's starting points. It's not the fact that they have bad nutrition, bad housing, you know, that they have terrible health care, that they're, by the time they reach school, they're hungry, they are sick, they're not in the state of mind to learn anything, and by the way, their home environment is a big struggle, so they're lucky that they get any nurturing at all. They don't have expensive daycare and preschool systems, which take care of some of these problems before they ever enter school. They don't discuss this. There's not a word about this in any OECD report, neither in the UNESCO report. So if you're really going to do this, if you really want to talk about the whole package, you've got to talk about the whole package. And you've got to try to describe the whole package. Okay. So <coughs> that's a big issue in all this stuff. And so the borrowing stuff of the best practices from high-scoring countries, there I'm quoting here, and that is that by identifying the characteristics of high-performing education systems, PISA's allow governments and education to identify effective policies that they can then adapt to their local context. And the OEC is full of suggestions about how to do this. Okay, well, they never talk about after-school education, for example. Pretty big in Asia. In fact, more is spent per capita on after-school education than on in-school education in many of these countries, privately. Okay? Not, a, not talked about. You'll not find it. There are questions in the questionnaire, but it's not discussed in the report. And if they did a decent analysis of this, it would really confuse the issue. Because the question is, where are the kids really learning all this stuff? Are they learning it in school, or are they learning it on test uh, prep courses? Good question. Some people have studied this, but it's not in here, and it's very misleading. I don't know how much is in either part, but it requires at least analysis and recognition that this is the issue. And finally, um, that the OECD is basically the decider. They've got the resources, by the way. They, the, uh, there's a very interesting analysis done by a woman at uh, George Washington, she just sent it to me, um, about the cost of the U.S. of participating in the PISA. It's a very large number. Now, poorer countries don't pay as much as the U.S., and that's fair, but the minimum, I think, is $300,000 a year right now. Is that right? Yeah. So, per year. Um, to just participate. Doesn't include the collection of the data, doesn't include any of that. So this is an expensive operation, and the OECD gets a lot of the money to do this, and they pay Pearson, who now designs the test before with Acer, uh, and these tests are proprietary. They're proprietary. You cannot get all the items unless you have an in at the mm -hmm. testing agency. So you can't see all the items. You can see a sample of items. So it's all proprietary stuff. And they do the analysis of all this. Publicly available, then you can do more analysis if you want. But most people will not read your article in the educational journal. Uh, they would prefer to read the PISA report. Okay, so they'll read that version. And most country policymakers will certainly not read the article that you've written. They'll read the PISA report. So here's some of the stuff that they have, some of some the policy recommendations that they've done. We've got to be careful about that. So um, higher expenditures on education, I'm quoting now, OECD 2013. Um, higher expenditures on education is not highly predictive of better PISA mathematics scores among OECD countries. Make that statement, okay? 
This suggests this, uh, 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 suggests the policy recommendation is not founded on causal inference at all. Estimates, which now have shown mm -hmm. that in fact spending does make a difference. Okay, particularly for low income kids. So this is 2013. Okay, by 2013, we've already had articles published about Chile, which increased the spending by 50 percent on lower income kids through the voucher system. They have a national voucher system. They increased the voucher for lower income kids by 50 percent. And so schools with a lot of lower income kids all of a sudden had a lot more money. And guess what? <coughs> Good causal analysis shows that their test scores went up significantly by two tenths of the standard deviation by fourth grade because of this increased spending. Even in the United States now, there's a very good study in Ohio, uh, I, I think it's Ohio, showing that districts under the, the adequacy position in Ohio uh, that low-income districts, not necessarily low-income kids, got more money, and this had a, a big effect on test scores in those districts. Okay, It's, it's ridiculous. Hanushek has been pushing this for years, that more money does not make a difference. It's a, it's a conservative axiom. More money will not make a difference. It's a lie. More money makes a difference. It does. It may not always make a difference if it's used ineffectively, but on average it makes a difference. It's very hard. My former school district in New York State, just 20 miles north of New York City, this year's budget for that school district was $25,000 per kid. All right? Now, <coughs> cost of living is a little bit higher in New York than in Michigan, but let's say that Michigan would spend $20,000 per kid. Okay? <laughs> Is anybody in this room willing to argue that your schools would not be better? <laughs> Particularly schools for low-income urban kids? By the way, New York City spends $14,000. Okay? 20 miles away, $25,000. There's another district in Westchester County, north of New York City, $39,000 per kid. Okay. So it's a ridiculous statement to say, that more money doesn't make a difference, particularly for, for places that don't spend very much on okay. Norwegian schools could become better by closing smaller schools, increasing class size, introducing more testing, publishing <laughs> results at school and teacher level, and basing teacher payments on achieved test results. This is from the OECD. Higher spending on schools will have no effect. This is cited by Posse Schoberg, who went around the world talking about Finland, the fin Finnish lessons, and talking and saying that Finns did not achieve this by spending more money. And I pointed out to him that he forgot to include the fact that they have the most expensive preschool and daycare system in the world, which the average Finnish kid spends five years in that system before ever entering first grade. Not included. The health care of the teachers is not paid, like here, by the school districts, and it's included in the education budget. It's paid by the national health care system, completely off budget for the education system. Not included. It's 20% of the cost in a typical school district. Okay, so let's be careful with these policy conclusions. OEC is not careful, I can tell you, not careful at all. So I'm not going to read you this thing, uh, but it is based on the Hanushek data, the Hanushek studies, uh, which have proliferated, um, and do show correlations between higher test scores and growth rates. I don't disagree with that. There are such correlations. What they mean is another story. It's correlations. What they mean is another story. Okay, but it has become the basis of a lot of statements like this one, uh, that you can increase your GDP for, uh, by a huge amount if you just increase test scores. Um, well, um, I, this is a little bit too long to go through, but the fact is that um, 
one of the problems, and I'll show you some examples of this, is that some countries take the tins and the pizza, and the results are different in some countries for the two tests. I mean, over time. So, the question is, what does that mean? Um, and neither these are tins results over time within and between countries presents results adjusted for the changing social class conditions of the samples, I told you that. And neither tests adjust for outside of school investments, I told you that. And both tests present a series of cross-section pictures or benchmarks uh, over time. Um, uh, even adjusted for SES, they do not re represent the value added at, at all of formal schooling since we don't have any baseline achievement scores for these students. So we did, in Russia, uh, we uh, were able to get the, um, the, the same agency does the PISA and the TIMS, so we convinced them in 2012 to give the PISA test to all, the entire TIMS sample of 2011. Okay, the TIM, with all the data that we had from the TIMS, and we then re-interviewed the teachers as part of that survey with the PISA, because the PISA does interview the teachers, and the teachers are largely the same in eighth and ninth grade in, in Russia for, for math and science. And so uh, we tested the, uh, the kids again, and so we had a benchmark. We, I mean, we had a control test, the TIMS, different tests. So economists don't worry about this. Um, uh, it's just a, it's a, we just say, okay, that's sort of a measure of ability. The TIMS is sort of a measure of earlier ability uh, in the eighth grade compared to ninth grade. So we had a value, kind of value added, and it was very interesting. Uh, Bill Schmidt participated in that paper because we used his measure of um, what math, of, of math curriculum uh, that was included in the PISA test of 2012. We got some interesting results it's published in the AERJ, but the results are very different from the straight correlation, by the way. Uh, so uh, an interesting, it's a single study that shows that really has had some ability control for uh, the PISA test. And many federal countries, by the way, <coughs> test, as I told you, in the various states. So uh, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, that. But the most important thing to take away, which is a big uh, a, a pet peeve of mine, and that is that people keep talking about the U.S. education system in these tests. There is no U.S. education system. It's a, it's a fiction. It's a fictitious thing, and it's very misleading. Okay. Many of our educational, many of our systems, my state included, are much larger than many of the countries included in PISA, and they're operated by the state of California. I mean, federal government, except for Title I money, has no impact on what California does, thank God. Anyway, so, uh, so Betsy DeVos' persona non grata, uh, you, you, I'll, we'll leave her in Michigan, thank you. Oh, oh thanks a lot. <laughs> and, but the thing is that, that it, the same thing, of course, is true about Michigan. You know, Michigan has to live with its state legislature and its people, and, you know, for better or for worse, federal government has no influence. California has no influence on what Michigan does. So, to talk about the U.S. educational system is, is silly. And by the way, to one degree or another, there's more federal government influence in many other countries, uh, federal countries. Um, we're, at the, we're at sort of an extreme end of the spectrum of, of federal control over what goes on in education. But in Brazil, the states have a lot of power over the education system. By the way, municipalities do at the primary level. The states don't even control those municipal schools. And uh, so you, you have to take account when you're talking about policy of who the deciders are. I mean, uh, economists have dealt with this problem for years in doing production functions for education. We've always, it's very difficult to do a production function. You have to decide <coughs> what is the unit, the decision making unit when you do a production function. Should it be the classroom? Should it be the school? Should it be the district? Should it be the state? You know, should it be the country? Well, in this case, it's definitely not the country in the United States. And so, um, 
Uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about other kinds of analysis, which may be more useful. So here is my first uh, graph, uh, and this is Australia. Uh, so Australia is a federal country. They have eight states, uh, two are the most populous, uh, New South Wales and Victoria. But this is for the country as a whole. By the way, 40% of kids in Australia go to private schools, subsidized by the government. Okay, So it's a complicated system, but um, uh, which are uh, Catholic is the biggest single thing, and then non-Catholic, many of them religious too, by the way. So here are the TIM scores. They're the ones that are going down and then up. And the PISA scores with, for math are going straight down. And by the way, in 2018, continue down. And these are corrected for social class changes in the sample. And um, this is inexplicable. We tried to explain it in the paper. We tried to explain the PISA scores going down. Nobody could go. Nobody <coughs> We tested every idea that Australian policymakers had about this, and none of it panned out. There's no explanation for it. I mean, that we could find, or that anybody came up with. Okay? So, um, the question is, are they really going down? Tim says they're not, not at least since 2000 and, 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 and uh, seven. And here's the U.S., same problem. Now, by the way, this is not true for all countries that took Tim's and Pisa. Some countries, they behave the same. But in neither the U.S. or Australia do they. So the, the, the dark, the solid lines, I just wanted to show you a social class correction. This social class correction is just across time. It's the change sample within the test. So the TIMS test, the original TIMS test, in 1995, the kids were of higher social class than they are after uh, 2007. And if, once you correct it, the test scores go way down. If you corrected the 2012, it's all corrected to 2012, the TIMS 2011. So it's correct to the two, it's as if the kids in 2000 now had the same distribution, social class distribution, as in 2011. Okay. <coughs> so they go down. So you can see that they're going up, and the PISA scores went down and up and down again, and they went down a little bit more in 2018, I think. I, they haven't corrected for 2018, but... Um, so that's what that looks like. So everybody laments the latest PISA scores, saying, you know, we had Dan Koritz from Harvard saying we got to abandon uh, uh, Common Core uh, because uh, well, we have to rethink the Common Core because the <coughs> scores aren't going up. I mean, this kind of crap that you get around these tests. I mean, honestly. I mean, who knows whether the kids are really learning more or less. They just didn't learn more on the, whatever this test was testing. They didn't learn more. Now, someone could argue that, oh, we changed the curriculum so it would be more like the PISA curriculum, PISA test, and then the score still didn't go up. Well, it takes a long time. Let's see what happens. I don't care, really, what the result is, but it, it would be helpful to look at all these tests and see what's happening. By the way, until recent years, the NAEP scores have gone up by huge amounts. You know, one standard deviation in fourth grade, seven tenths of a standard deviation in eighth grade math. These are big gains. Okay, I'll show you something. So here's the unfortunate story of Finland. Finland was the exemplar, you know, for non-Asian countries. Okay, so okay, you don't can't be like the Asian countries, but Finland, they, you know, they look like. Midwesterners. And so surely we could get Michigan to get its test scores as high as Finland. It's the same people, right? Probably a lot of Finns are from Michigan, right? So don't have to say different culture, all that kind of stuff. So here's what happened. Everybody was going off to Finland and finding that, by the way, Finland has a terrific educational system. They do. Their teachers are well trained, their kids are happy, you know, and, and, and 
things like that. And they seem to be learning a lot, and they did very well on this test. So correcting for social, everybody corrected to finish social class uh, books in the home we use here. Uh, distribution in 2003, we used the same weights across countries and across time. So this is as if they were the same social classes of finished sample in 2003. Everywhere. Okay, so it's correct for that, adjusted for that. So look what happened to finished scores. Between 2003 and 2015, they dropped by a lot. And by the way, in 2018, went down even further. And the U.S. dropped a little bit in 2018, but basically didn't change. These are the math scores. And here are the reading scores. U.S. went up. And Finland went down in reading scores. And so, what are, what are we complaining about? The reading scores are going up in the US. Finnish scores are going down. Should we really go to Finland and see what they're doing? No. We should go to the US, see what they're doing. But they're going up. Finland's going down. I mean, do you want to be with a loser or a winner? <laughs> <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? Why are we going to Finland to see what they're doing when their test scores are going down? Well, I mean, Helsinki is a very nice place to visit. Is it? <laughs> good, <laughs> good smoked fish. <laughs> very good smoked fish. I agree. It's not the most exciting town in the world, but I don't know. New York is better. Anyway, so, I, I'm just trying to play with your minds a little bit because people, people <clears throat> buy in they buy into a lot of hype, and an international agency should not be selling hype around these issues. These are expensive decisions to make, and you have to be very careful what you're selling if you're going to tell people to do stuff around education, because there's a lot of kids' lives involved. Uh, the Finns have a great education system, there's no question about it. But the question is, in terms of policy, the policy that drove those scores up occurred in the 80s and 90s. Okay, no question about it. They did a sustained set of reforms that we could well look at, by the way. Very hard to implement in most of the U.S., but we should certainly look at what they did. But the fact is, we may be already doing some of that. We may be doing some of that. And we should recognize what, what's going on. Now, this is another interesting thing in terms of what comparing the U.S. with other countries. I don't know how easy it is to read this, but three states took the, the PISA in 2012. And I corrected all the uh, stuff to the social class of the U.S., that the family, we call them family academic resources family academic resource is not really a measure of social class. It's a measure of family academic resource. So look at Florida. Florida's math and reading. Okay, U.S. does much better in reading than it does in math. It's kind of interesting. But the Florida, the Florida scores lower than any of these other countries, far lower in math than any of these other countries. On the other hand, Massachusetts scores as high as any of these other countries, except Korea in mathematics, and scores higher than any of the other countries in reading. And these countries include UK, uh, Canada, Finland, Korea, Poland, and Ireland. Except for UK, these are all considered high-scoring countries. Ireland's just not, uh, not as high in math, but they're, they're considered sort of emerging Poland and Ireland. Have considered emerging high school and countries. So, in terms of Massachusetts, Massachusetts has 50% larger population than Finland. They're much more diverse, by the way. And they do as well in math and Finland better in reading. So, why, except for the good smoked fish <laughs> and being in an exotic place, Finland, you should probably go to Massachusetts to see what's going on. And there's good reason to go to Massachusetts. Uh, um, and uh, <laughs> uh, 
after he retired from being Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan came out to give a talk in Silicon Valley. I went to the talk, and I talked to him afterwards, and I said, you know, you keep trying to send people to all these places. Why don't you send to Massachusetts? He said, we're just sick of Massachusetts. You know, Massachusetts is one state. I said, well, these are just one, you know, why are you sending people to Shanghai, for Christ's sake? I mean, what, what does Shanghai have anything to do with anything in the United States except maybe San Francisco or Chinatown? Uh, really, there's no there there. And he didn't, didn't seem to get it. And finally, uh, he admitted that maybe Massachusetts was a good place to send people, but... Um, I would even argue that people from Alabama shouldn't go to visit Massachusetts because it's the, the situation is so different. Alabama is the lowest scoring state in the U.S. on the map. <coughs> but neighboring Georgia, on the other hand, has made big gains. Okay? Alabama should go next to Georgia and see what has Georgia done. That, you know, very similar population, about 20% African American in both cases. And, Similar situation, you know. So, um, anyway, all this suggests that maybe in federal countries it would be better to look across states. First of all, they're culturally much more similar, culturally, although it's a big word, culturally, but certainly educationally, they're much more similar and, um, than looking across countries where there are very different historical conditions for the education system, and very different views about the role of education, and about social life in general. Okay, Finland, honestly, is, is a very collectivized society, and I'm not even worried about homogeneous ethnically, because they do have 15% Swedes, but, <laughs> uh, but in any case, they, they are, uh, it's much easier to do policy in a country like that, than it would be in a highly diverse society. Uh, and, but there's a lot to learn. It, I'm not saying there's nothing to learn from that, but you've got to understand that it was run by a coalition built around the Communist Party for many years, and they were the reason that you got all these reforms in the 80s and 90s. And it was sustained over a long period of time. That coalition was in power for a long period of time. And that's why we got a lot of reforms passed and very systematic. It's worth reading about them. But you have to think, is that an example for one of the US states? Um, Brazil is the same situation. There's more reason to look at PISA test results in Brazil because uh, Brazil is way down on the PISA. And so even the top Brazilian state doesn't do that great on the PISA, but there are states that do a lot better than other states, and they have done specific reforms to get there. And so another state in Brazil might well look at what they've done with, a, with much more chance of borrowing from that than going to another country. Um, so here's an example that I want to tell you about Massachusetts and Connecticut from the Navy. So the, 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 uh, this is all corrected to the U.S. Uh, family academic resource distribution. And the solid lines, uh, the sort of yellowish line is Massachusetts, and the blue line is Connecticut. Now these are neighboring states. They're both small states. They're both pretty similar diversity-wise. And you can see that until the year 2003, they had very similar gains in math score. And in 2003, Connecticut sort of levels off, and Massachusetts in continues to increase at a very high rate. So that by 2013, Massachusetts is a half a standard deviation above Connecticut in 10 years. Now, what did they do to do this? I can't tell you exactly. I can get to tell you some things that they did. Um, uh, Bill Schmidt has uh, verified uh, some of this stuff, and there are other states that did similar stuff with similar results. And that is, A, they put in the new math standards of 88 that were developed uh, by mathematicians. They put those in. 
Then they taught the teachers how to teach those things. Mm. Then they increased their budget for education much faster than Connecticut. They're both high spending states. But they, during the 90s, Massachusetts greatly increased the budget for education. Connecticut did not. And they used the money to do this, to do this reform. And they put in an accountability system where they tested the kids on the famous MCAT test. And so they had an idea of what all the schools were doing. Now, Massachusetts is a hard state to do this in because they have lots of small school districts. Okay? So it's not easy organizationally to do this, but they did it. And there are other states that did the same. Texas is the red line, California is the blue line. And I carried this all the way out to 2017. 20, and yeah. And this is really interesting because Texas did all these same things that Massachusetts did in math with the same results. Tremendous increases through the 90s and into the 2000s. Um, and then, and California sort of loped along. They had a, a bump uh, in, in 2000 because they had a lot more money because of the dot-com boom and they spent a lot more money and they had a bump, but they didn't sustain it. They didn't sustain any of this stuff. And now, they finally started sustaining stuff so that while most states are going down on the NAEP, including Texas taking a tremendous dive after 2011, California continues to go up. This is in mathematics. Okay, they did a very special implementation. They stopped the all state testing for three years while they put in the Common Core. They trained the teachers. There are a lot of problems. It's a big state, a very big state, very hard to manage all this stuff. But so is Texas a big state. And so what's happened is that the gap has dropped between Texas and California, much to the glee of my uh, uh, colleague, Linda Darling Hammond, who's now the, and my former, and my colleague, Mike Kirst, who were in that order, both uh, the, the chairs of the, uh, um, there was, was basically the um, state superintendents, uh, two academics from Stanford, state superintendents uh, under Brown and now under Newsom, and they're just very happy with these results because of the, the stuff that they're doing. Um, why Texas is going down, um, one of you should research this. Very interesting issue. Okay. Same as Australia. Why are they going down? Okay, to summarize, comparing average unadjusted SES for SES student test scores and the student teacher uh, data uh, of all these uh, tests across countries can give us considerable information about educational systems in those countries but are not very useful in understanding why educational systems differ, how effective they are, or how various policies influence their effect. They're just not useful for them. They're, they're cross-section studies. You can, doing some fancy statistics, you can get some information about time, the effect of time, and the visa, and things like that. But even, I have my doubts about that, because that's student-reported time in the classroom. So, the OECD tries to shape the policy discussion, and they really do try to shape it, by analyzing views data by themselves and drawing uh, unsubstantiated policy conclusions about the effectiveness of the system. And they make unsubstantiated recommendations to countries worldwide about effective educational policy. One of the interesting things is back in 2011, the OECD produced a report, Lessons Learned from PISA for the U.S., and they suggested to look at reforms in Ontario. Okay. What was interesting about it is that Ontario is one of the lower scoring provinces in Canada. And they also have not made gains over time on the pieces. Why they would suggest reforms in Ontario is beyond me, but one reason is they don't want to look at Quebec because Quebec is a French-speaking province. And so that would not be so suitable to tell the U.S. to copy a French-speaking province, but by the way, Quebec gets the highest test scores in Canada, and you might want to learn something about the way they teach math, 
which is much more the French system uh, than the American system of teaching math. And this would very much play into Bill Schmidt's lab, Richard Wallen lab uh, work on the math, because that's exactly what the Common Core is trying to do. It's trying to push away from the mile wide and steep stuff to the more European way of teaching math. Um, okay, so I think it's drawing attention for more useful ways of using the data. And some of the ways that I, I would do that would be much more useful for me as a comparative educator, just coming from my standpoint as that kind of analyst, uh, to, and illuminating uh, to go back to basics and try to understand why students in some countries and regions test so well. I mean, go back and say, why are they scoring higher in the test? Rather than saying, it, they're scoring higher in the test because they have better education. Mm -hmm. uh, go back and say, why are they? What's the reason they're scoring higher in the test? Uh, if, for example, let's say, again, May have told us this summer ago, I don't want to repeat myself to the students may have said, that what if I told you that we should emulate countries in providing whatever we do who win the World Cup in soccer? <laughs> you know, it takes a hell of an organization to win the World Cup. It isn't just having the best players. You really got to be organized. There's a reason the women in the U.S. win the World Cup. It's a very well-organized program for women. And they have good players, it's true, but it's also well-organized. Well, women were in the World Our women win the World Cup. So everybody should now turn to the U.S. to figure out how they did this and copy that in everything. That's the implication of these tests. Education system is a big deal in every country. You're getting right into the core of a, a society, how it organizes education. So now we're being told Singapore scores high on the test. We should be like Singapore. Stop chewing gum. It's going to be arrested. <laughs> I'm going to try and tell you that if, if Brazilians spent as much time after school studying how to take tests in math and science, mostly math and science, <coughs> they would be much better at taking tests in math and science. They would probably not win the World Cup or something. <laughs> they lose something, right? So. Countries value different stuff for their kids. I would definitely not like to have my kids going two hours a day to claim courses after mm -hmm. school. I would argue against that with my kids. Mm -hmm. I would much rather have them doing other stuff if I could do, you know, control what my kids do. But <laughs> that's, I would definitely choose to have them have a much broader thing. And Americans do that. They do that. Now, you could argue that they should be sending them to take grant courses, but I doubt that most Americans would go for that. So we should analyze why it's happening, and not analyze with judging that one thing is better than the other. Just judge what are they doing? What, what is it about the society that allows them to do this? See it from that standpoint. It may be that among those things, their education system is organized in some better ways. And we can learn some lessons from that. But we shouldn't start from that point. And then we should come up with new theories of comparing student learning across nation states and even across sub-regions of nation states. It requires looking beyond formal education system and traditional measures of SES toward expanding conceptualizations of social capital, culture, and where and how children engage to acquire knowledge. And what kinds of knowledge they're acquiring. That's my next thing. Because we should start measuring different kinds of knowledge that kids are acquiring. We're measuring one kind of knowledge on each of these tests. And they measure different knowledge, by the way. They have different conceptions of what is a math knowledge. And we have to recognize that they're not so different because results on the test from Russia, 70% correlation between the Finnish results and the Finnish results. But 
thirty percent. Not okay, and so those, there are differences between the tests. They measure different things. Now they measure some things about learning, but there are lots of other kinds of learning that takes place. Okay, and this is a very biased measure of what is learning. Uh, and I think current learning theory could help us design new ways to understand what educational systems actually do in different societies, rather than comparing education systems' effectiveness and doing one or two things that we choose to measure about them. And these two measurements could cover persistence, discipline, <coughs> willingness to postpone gratification, engagement with tasks, innovativeness, all possibly good predict uh, predictors of aspects of learning and possibly better predictors of future life chances. Maybe <coughs> kids in some countries are really much better prepared to deal with the vagaries of life or responding to change. Maybe. We, don't, we should develop measures of that to try to understand what it is that's happening in the larger educational system. Everything, the entire education system will be called the broad notion of education. Anyway, thank you very much. We have some time. We have lots of people answering sure their questions. So <laughs> we're going to let you field your questions. Mm -hmm. Rebecca Jacobson. Hi, Rebecca. Um, My co-author. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things that I'm surprised that often gets left out of the media reporting is, is and you brought this up, is the values, right? What do, what do we value, um, and how is that so different? Like, what do we value for our children, what we want childhood to look like, what we want learning to look like? And I'm struck at how much Americans really want their kids to be happy and have fun. Um, and that's not necessarily conducive to um, test score outcomes, but might be really good for self-esteem and some of these other things. And I was just wondering if you know of any thing that has tried to capture the, around the learning theory, but also values or theories about what childhood should look like, right? Because well, education is a big component of childhood. Well, uh, there's a very famous book, I forget the name of the author, about um, the history of childhood of the meaning of, of what, how childhood is conceived. Uh, what? Who is it? Philip Arias? Arias, yeah. It's a great, it's a great book. Everybody should read it. It's an old book. It's a, it's a really interesting book. It looks, child, the notion of childhood has changed dr drastically over time. And um, it, even within countries, I, I mean, obviously, in, in poor rural societies, uh, children are seen very differently than they are in, you know, fairly high income uh, urban societies. Uh, uh, children were seen as future sources of income for the family, not for themselves. And so the investment, in some sense, in terms of family human capital, I mean, they were really seen in a different way. And so the decisions, the decision making process about them <clears throat> was different. And I think that um, what I was trying to get at, Rebecca, was if we would start, instead of starting even from a conception of what uh, different societies, how they view the, the childhood or the values about childhood, we should measure actually what they do rather than what they say they value. I mean, economists will always tell you. They should talk about revealed preference, not do some survey and ask somebody what they think. Ask, see what they do. And that's why I think these, uh, actually, we did a better job of trying to understand what, uh, if we had more measures of children's, uh, what, what young people, what kind of skills they had, uh, not only testing skills, but as I say, persistence. I and mean, there are lots of ways to measure these things. And we could and we could do that. And it would be pretty interesting because that would begin to tell us, in a sense, what society does value. Because 
I truly believe that these outcomes are not serendipitous. They are the product of choices that society's made. Uh, North Asian societies, and I'm thinking about society-wide, not just the government, society-wide, definitely value these kinds of measures of education more than other societies. Okay. And I only say that not because I've done some anthropological study of these societies, but because I see how much they're spending on this stuff, how much the families are spending on it, and how much time the kids are involved in it. I mean, you can't do that without some sort of deep social acceptance of this as a way of life. Okay, and, uh, and so I think that's a valuable thing to understand, but I don't know if you want to hold it up as a, something that everybody should emulate. That's the only thing I'm saying. It's, it's interesting to understand it, but other societies bring other stuff. And I know that, and I know from, you know, all the stuff, I, the time I spent in Asia and talking to my former Asian students who were involved in policy and stuff, they're very concerned about this, actually. They have a concern that these kids are spending all their lives in cramp courses after school there and have their own kids. And they go along with the game, but they're not happy about it. And, and they see American society. And what's really interesting is that the kids come to school in the United States, and there are many kids that come to school in the United States from Asia. They love it. But they're happier, okay? Because they don't have to do the crowd court. Well, I'm, I'm not sure if they do or they don't. I'll, I'll tell you, it's sort of an interesting factor. These Massachusetts scores on PISA, because 5% of the, of the sample in Massachusetts are self-identified Asian. Asian Americans, self-identified, could mean anything, could mean Indian, any, big, Asia's big, you know. So anybody self-identified Asian as an ethnic group, they score as high as in Singapore, in Massachusetts, okay. So, well, you know, I, I, it's a small group. Uh, by the way, their social, their social class, as measured by articles at home, is lower than in Japan and China, okay, or Korea, and we did that test. So they come from a lower socioeconomic background than the kids taking the, the tests. In, I think I looked at Korea and Japan, <coughs> and I, maybe I didn't look at China, but. So I think you're right, but I would look at the other way around. I would look at what, I would use all this wonderful information and, and more information to try to understand what's happening in society. And um, <coughs> that's generally my point of view. My point of view is that we can't study education without studying the, so the social context. And that education is a window into the social context in different societies. And I think it's really a valuable way to look at it. There's no way to separate the education system from social value. So, <coughs> listening to this, um, put very simply, you're saying international testing has lots of negative impacts. The way, I also hear the way it's interpreted. The way it's used. Yeah. It's how it's used. But I also hear you saying it's not going away. It's not going away. <coughs> so, given the... It may die because, it, <laughs> I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why it may, it may ease off. I think it's going to ease off, number one, because the test scores are not going up. Okay, that's one thing. And in, in a number of countries that were originally high scoring, they're going down. <laughs> Australia is not the only one. Finland is not the only one. They're going down. There are at least eight or nine countries going down. Germany, which was a poster child of PISA, right? Because they discovered in 2000 they weren't scoring very high, so they made all these reforms. Nobody can tell you what they are, but they made all these reforms. It turns out that the scores went up not for ethnic Germans, but for Slavic immigrants. Those are the scores that went up. 
they may have just taught German better to these immigrants, but they have lots of immigrants. Mm -hmm. But not, I'm not talking about Syrians who took <coughs> I'm talking about the big immigration into Germany is from the Slavic countries, so you know, former Yugoslavia, Poland, you know, all over, Ru Russia now. So those are the scores that are going up. But in any case, they're now going down. They topped in the 2012, I think, and now they're going down. So nobody talks about Germany anymore, nobody talks about Finland anymore. No, uh, Poland actually eased off too. Uh, and so that may be the end of it. If, if you keep having to spend uh, uh, literally 60, 70, 80 million dollars a year doing this test, after a while, if the scores don't go up, they're going to say, why do we keep doing this? What is it telling us anymore? And I think that may be one thing. But generally, you're right. Uh, this idea of testing kids and using this as a measure of the, the quality of the education, so pure and simple, without any of the caveats that I've talked about, that's here to stay for a long time. So I guess if we use your, um, your way of looking at the data, a, a question that comes from me in this is, so we see testing is, is here, at least for now, and it's a huge industry. And so there's a lot of sort of vested interest mm -hmm. in it remaining. I'm curious if you look across countries where you see not about test scores, but engagement with the test policy systems that say, this doesn't matter to us as much. We're stepping away. Do you see any any sense of possibility for policy people to recognize there's an alternative? So it doesn't have to be the whole system crashes, or individual policy jurisdictions can say, no, we don't care anymore, or this is not the version of what we behind here. Well, you know, the, here, here's, here's one of the real problems. The problem is that there are very few places in the world that have a capacity to do this on their own, okay? So there, there are a number of places that have the capacity to do it. We're certainly one of them. And we're like a leader in analyzing educational data. What's remarkable to me is how little policymakers pay attention. Isn't it remarkable? So, uh, because, well, there are a lot of reasons. But the, uh, education is very ideological. Uh, everybody's gone to school. I mean, the, great, the greatest case is economists talking about education. They usually base entirely on what happens to their kids in their kids' school. <laughs> and they draw all kinds of theories from this, and that's it. Uh, so everybody does this, right? Um, Someone told me a story yesterday, uh, I think it was uh, David uh, who does science, what? Stuart, who does science education, he said he went into some meeting uh, with some science people and the guy started talking about some science board or something and the, the, the head of the science board was a physicist and he said, this is not, my, my wife is a teacher, this is not what she tells me. Anyway, that's <laughs> one observation. So, the capacity to do this kind of analysis is limited, and that's why these OECD analyses are so pervasive, because this is all that, this is what people rely on. The OECD knows this. Um, I've, done, I've done missions for the OECD, and it's always amazed me. They do not pay anybody to do these missions. I mean, I forced them to pay me because I had to write the report, but they pay me a little bit to do that. But usually you don't pay anybody. The missions are interesting, there's no question. They're a real opportunity to observe a lot of stuff. But they don't pay anybody. And yet they're very highly paid. And so what I can never figure out is why countries like listen to their every word. I and mean, it's really remarkable. And they know this. They, they have a brand. Branding is very important. They have this brand. And so, that's why I'm so upset about some of the stuff they're doing because their their economic stuff is a lot better, by the way. Their economic <coughs> reports and stuff that was the original thing that they were supposed to be doing. Uh, uh, 
But I don't think it's easy. I mean, I've just spent nine years with one university in Russia building capacity to do policy research and education. And it's working, but it's a long haul process. So to do the kind of thing that you're proposing, where each country can really take fresh looks at themselves and start really trying to understand what's going on, that can happen. We're trying to urge wherever countries are to you know, get control of this themselves. Now the Chileans do a very good job of this because they have a lot of people and they have a lot of data. By the way, data is also very limited in most places. In mm -hmm. most places, these are the only data you have. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's another problem. Even in Russia, Russia has no publicly available school census. Cool. <laughs> I mean, every, I can imagine that. They don't know anything about, in detail, about what's going on who, mm -hmm. in their schools. They, someone has it, but they won't release it, you know. So there's secrecy about data. So I mean, there are lots of limits to doing it. And that's why this void is filled by international agencies and wh whatever quality they do, that's it. We're, we're, in a lot, we're in a very luxurious situation in terms of data and in terms of our capacity to analyze data. And even so, the policymakers don't listen to it. <laughs> Do you have a perspective on where we are in the rich world and the poor world all over comparatively on education as the elixir, the promise, the magic potion that sort of causes us all to buy into society and the structures of society? Do you I know, have a point of view on that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I do. <laughs> are we in crisis? Is, are we too upset? What's, you know, yeah. what's going on? Well, as an economist, I'm going to tell you something that's going to shock you. I am uh, very skeptical about the role of education as the, the main driver of economic growth. Um, I'm not saying it doesn't contribute to economic growth. Uh, or, even more skeptical about the main driver of income distribution. Mm -hmm. okay. So, I'm very skeptical about both those things. Doesn't mean that education doesn't play some role in that, both in the qu quantity side and the quality side. Well, it's, it's, it's had such a profound role in, the, in, our, in our politics, right, in, our, in the way Right. This is the promise that's, that's sold to people, right? right? Go to school, right? There's some version of this, go to school and things will be okay and we'll take care of you. There's some version of that narrative everywhere, right? Absolutely. It's, yeah. a, very, it's, it's a main, I would say it's a main theme of uh, capitalist development and post-capitalist development, by the way, and post-capitalist development. And uh, the idea that, the, that education that with education, we can solve all our social problems. Um, and it's, a, but it's very important politically that way. Because, first of all, I would say, I, I, I have a very, I would say, remember, I believe that theories of the state are very important in understanding education. So, if you believe that the state is the reflection the public sector is the reflection of individual, the collective of individual values. Um, if you believe that, that's one view. And then you could say, well, if people believe this about education, it's because they are, they've had the experience of this, and therefore it must be true. Or you can believe, as I do, that there's although there's certainly a, a mod, enough truth in that idea of education solving social problems that, the, that you can convince people of it, that it's not totally false news. But there's, I do believe that it's also this elixir that sort of helps keep unequal societies functioning because it puts the blame 
mm -hmm. onto individuals for not succeeding in a system that was set up for you to succeed. Mm -hmm. And you just didn't succeed. Mm -hmm. okay, so, so it puts the blame on the individual rather than helping the individual to understand and to solve the problem of barriers to entry. Mm -hmm. and do you think that the policy activity that you discussed today or our different policy turmoil in the U.S., you know, in the domestic context, do you think that we're in the new phase where that that narrative has been compromised in the way that it just it just doesn't work as well politically as it did 25 years ago? Or is are we just too attuned to to the trials of the education regime in this community and that the public at large is just willing that, that this elixir still works? Well, what, what I find heartening, I don't know how long it's going to take for the American public to buy it, but um, the, what, what I find heartening is that finally some people are saying that we're simply not going to be able to provide you with adequate social services unless you're willing to tax the rich. Because unfortunately for the rich, they make most of the income. And, and that's the, important, the, the downside of being rich is that you make most of the income. So you are the source of public services. I mean, if there are to be public services. And so, I mean, the, I, the rich would like you to believe that tax policy will distort, higher taxes will distort the economy and therefore make things worse. <clears throat> and therefore, you should put all your focus in on low-cost solutions to educational quality, low-cost solutions to educational quality, of which there are none, by the way. And <laughs> so, uh, there, that's what you should focus on, that simply taxing people is not going to solve the, the problem of growth and better public services and a better society, etc. So that's why they so hate the Scandinavian examples, which have growth and much greater equality and much better public services, but and they fight tooth and nail against you know sort of that socialist solution. But it, it's even worse because within education, the idea of low cost solution is a diversion which guarantees that the educational system will not improve. Okay. So all this stuff, and you've had to face this much more than we have in California, but in California you have the same problem of this idea of charters and that. Uh, and, uh, I don't think you have vouchers, do you? Yeah. No, the charter, you have charters. But other places, have vouchers. Yeah, Milwaukee's, I've studied Milwaukee extensively. Mm. Uh, I've been in Milwaukee several times and discussed it with, with the lovely people in the public system. Uh, if Milwaukee, Milwaukee's now, uh, total choice uh, district. Total choice. Twenty-five percent of kids go to their neighborhood school. Seventy-five percent go to other public schools, charter schools, voucher schools. Twenty-eight percent go to the thirty percent go to voucher schools. The private schools funded by that. Total choice. You can go wherever you want. If that were the solution, Milwaukee, and by the way, Detroit second place, mm -hmm. would be the highest scoring urban areas, and certainly the fastest growing uh, test scores in urban areas. And of course, they're not. They're at the bottom of the heap. It's a diversion. These are all diversions from the real issue. So if you really believe that education is the solution, you better get in for the long haul and lots of money. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to cap the money from somewhere. So that's what you believe. If you believe that other things like infrastructure and uh, you know better health care and all this kind of stuff are accessible to everybody, if those contribute to the solution, then you also better be in for the long haul and lots of money. Okay. <clears throat> all the other solutions are diversions. And what you're trying to point to, I think, is that we also be, should be conscious of the fact that education itself is a solution to social problems, is also 
partially a diversion, partially a diversion. So I'm a firm believer in everybody having a great education, but I don't necessarily believe that this is going to solve the income distribution problem or even the growth problem. It's going to contribute to it, but it doesn't solve it. The solutions are elsewhere and much broader. Here's a chance for you to take us out on a positive note. It's a yes or no. It's, it's a yes or no a positive question. note. We, we can do these things. It's a, it's a yes or no question. It's a yes or no question. So over the past several decades, um, by the standards of these assessments, is the world getting smarter? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> the kids in the U.S. are definitely smarter. There's no doubt about it. They're better. They have more level. More. They have higher attainment, and I can tell you by looking at the math textbooks, I don't know if they're being taught as well, but there's certainly the curriculum is a lot better. Uh, I mean, they're learning stuff today that was unimaginable for me to learn in, in high school or, or even middle school. And I think on average, the teachers are getting better too, on average. Uh, however, however, there are the bad news is that the average <laughs> social class of our students is going down. That's the bad news. And we're not prepared to deal with that. And the solution is not to turn the whole country into rural white America. Because that <laughs> is not going to happen. So we have to face the fact that the future, and by the way, California is in much worse shape in that sense than Michigan. Because in California, 50% of the kids in K-12 now are Latinos. Not just minorities, but Latinos. And those kids have lower attainment, and they don't have the lowest test scores in the world, but they have lower attainment, which is very important. They have lower aspirations for attainment. And the state faces a huge problem because it's going to, and it's not a high spending state, and it, it's already a highly taxed state. So it faces a huge problem of how to turn our Latino population into the future high skilled labor force that keeps driving California. And we can keep importing people, but we really have our native population is going to require. A, a lot of effort in order to continue to be, you know, we're the bigger economy than Italy. We're the fifth largest economy in the world, and it's built on it's built on very high end services and agriculture, but mostly high end services. So uh, I think the whole U.S. is faced to varying degrees by the same issue, uh, and and uh, I'm. The good news is that at least the NAEP scores for uh, lower social class and for uh, uh, kids of color are actually uh, going up as fast as the average. I mean, they're as fast as the white scores. So everybody's going up, but the fact is that the difference, and the differences are closing a little bit on, on race. And, and for non-E, um, ELL -L, uh, Hispanics. ELL, non ELL Hispanics are now scoring, once you break the social class, or score, there's basically no ethnic, uh, there's tiny uh, ethnic uh, gap. So it's a, so it's a more social class issue. So there are lots of good things happening in the system, uh, and the answer to your question, yes, they are on average. All right, I think we have lots to think about. I want to thank Martin. My pleasure. So, I'm going to leave a copy of the book with Lynn. And if you want to read it.